All right, I'm Jason Kreidner. I'm a, a co-founder of BeagleBoard.org. I'm a member of the local hackerspace, I3 Detroit. Um, the guy that started up this meetup, uh, David Sheltona, is a, took a job as an editor at Mank Magazine and moved away to California. He lives in Berkeley now and just kind of saddled me with this. And, you know, organiz organization like this sort of thing is really not been a focus of mine. Um, but I am at your service and happy to meet up with you at I3 Detroit if you ever have some Beagle project that you want some help debugging um, and, and you need some things. I'm on uh, the I3 Detroit IRC channel all the time as well as on the Hash Beagle IRC channel all the time if you're familiar with the IRC. Um, and if I can't answer your questions, I probably know somebody who can. Um, and that's probably more of my real value is connecting you up with other people that really um, know stuff. Um, so several of you are familiar. I think just a couple of you I don't know. Did, have we met before? I don't think so. I don't know. I've been to that game before. Um, I've been to PegonCon. I've been to PegonCon. Okay. Yeah. A couple of times. Oh. Cool. <laughs> You're Waldo. You may have seen me. I thought I saw you. Um, yeah, um, but a lot of people have been really interested in these, these peer reviews, uh, a couple other unfamiliar faces. Um, have we met before? Okay, hi, I'm Jason. Because I've met most of the people in the room from going to these, these meetups before, and I, um, I don't think we've met either. Nope, I'm Peter, and my colleague of Walkers, and he kept talking about Peter Boone gave me one for my birthday. Oh, there you go. <laughs> He keeps talking Spreads about in. his wheelchair, and uh, I used to work for a um, company that made industrial balancing machines. So I did spend 10 years of my life programming things going around and measuring stuff. So this is interesting to me, especially this stuff. Cool. Do you want to introduce yourself real quick? I'm Jeffrey. Hi, Jeffrey. <laughs> All right. Um, so uh, I got started this a few years ago, the, the Beagle Bone, um, so I, I grew up in Texas. Um, my wife's family is up here in, in Michigan and we moved up here to be closer to her family. Um, and um, you know, I still, I'm an employee of Texas Instruments, um, but I, um, you know, I pretty much do Beagle Board full time. Um, it's, it's cool for them because it promotes um, their processor um, it's cool for me because I can actually just focus on um, engaging open source developers and hackers and do educational focused things. And so it's a, it's a nice thing, but they, they pretty much let me run with it. Um, not that they give me a lot of resources, but they do continue to pay my salary. So that's a pretty good thing. It's a good resource. Um, they also pay Gerald, who's the hardware designer. I'm the, the software slash community guy. Um, and you know, more, more, more concept, but also dealing with all the, the Linux kernel um, craziness um, and that stuff. But we have um, some volunteers that really do most of the, the heavy lifting. Well, if you start flashing another board, um, the uh, like Robert Nelson is, is the main uh, kernel maintainer for, for BeagleBoard.org right now. He's actually an employee of DigiKey, if you know that. Um, I don't know if some of these boards are in the boot. Um, um, what, uh, what image is this based off of? It's the, nine, it's the September 3rd image. Um, so, but I've added a new, a new kernel. So it's posted as like a, is it June or the May uh, build? It's uh, it's a, there's a May build on the latest images. You have to go digging around if you want to find the kind of the test images. Yeah. There's a few things that aren't ready for prime time on this image. Um, I've, yeah, I kind of hacked the Bone 101 presentation a little bit to use Jekyll and it needs some, some Jekyll so that it, we can, Post it up to their GitHub pages. Mm -hmm. 
and so it's not really, so it's kind of messed up. Um, we've been actually trying to focus on moving to the 314 kernel. Um, uh, I don't know, we, we should probably go ahead and, and, and switch over something fairly soon. Um, but one of the other, one of the other holdups is the new image has grown a little bit, and so fitting on the two gig card is a little bit more of a, of a challenge. Um, so he's, the image that's under two gigabytes, now he's removed Chromium, which is the main web browser that's on there. So that's a pretty big subtraction. So that's another thing that's keeping me from switching it to be the main uh, default image. Um, but we've been shipping RFCs for a while. A lot of people are getting RFCs to four gigabyte. We might just go ahead and make the switch so that we have a default four gig image because there's enough stuff to, to kind of ship um, that's interesting. But I'm trying to get it done right first. The Beagle Mom's only got two gig on board, right? The, the Beagle Mom Black Rev A and B have two gig. Um, Rev C has four gig. And Rev C was the first one, I think, to ship with Debian as the default. Yes. Yeah, so that's the thing. And the Debian image is a whole lot easier to use than the um, than the Angstrom image, mostly because you can just kind of copy paste instructions from the web, um, and they they just work because most instructions are you know, written for Ubuntu or for Debian. Um, the other thing is uh, the Cloud9 IDE, the version three that we put in the Debian image, um, has a it's much less buggy, tremendously less buggy. It also has a built-in a command shell um, that um, that just works. It's weird. This one's not flashing. This one's just running. Um, yeah. Yeah. I'm not positive this is actually only set up properly as a flasher image. You do that Maker Fair thing in the Ford? Oh, do you want the modeler and innovators club or whatever? That down in the Ford Museum or whatever? I don't know. Oh, you mean Maker Fair? Maker Fair, yeah. Yeah, because we're yeah. both. Yeah, well, yeah, we were at Maker Fair. Like I threw that Maker Fair face was there. And you, you see those guys who were uh, what's the uh, HHO uh, welding torch? Mm. Like cutting steel on water. No, yeah, they did water jet cutting. Not water jet. It was uh, flame of the water. They, uh, oh, okay. Great like for flame. water. And yeah. the flame. Put your hand right through it. And the sides of the, of the burner, you can touch the temperature. But you point that, that at the uh, you know, uh, fire brick or steel to cut right through it and melt it. There's a memo, it's all the guy's stuff. It's really neat. Put the hand through the flames. Like, this thing is <laughs> it's not, it, it's warm. I wouldn't leave my hand there. Yeah, I'm gonna hand you the wrong micro. Try this one. <laughs> My bad. Right, here's an empty micro. Yeah. Not the one. It's a. You handed me a two gig. Yeah. You handed oh, me a you two know gig. what? Yeah. Yeah, that okay. is a different yeah. one. I handed you the wrong one. Give me that one back and I'll send it. Yeah. That would one. explain why it might not be doing the flashing. Uh, yeah, yeah, we copied to this one and then. There we go. Now this is doing a flasher. There we go. That's what I, I bet. That's what I wanted to see. Now it says it's erasing. The LEDs when it's doing the flashing does this little does the little uh, Cylon. the Cyloning back and forth. So that's how you know it's actually doing the flashing. Oscillating. Yeah. Very helpful. All right. Uh, let's try to get into some some PRU stuff so we actually have some time to talk about it. It's a pretty pretty complicated topic. Um, getting easier all the time, but still not quite for the every person. Um, um, everybody kind of familiar with what a BeagleBone Black is? No, not everybody. Um, so it's one of these, 
It's a $50, or roughly $50, uh, gigahertz open hardware computer. Um, it's open hardware because you can get the schematics, um, you can get the, um, the layout files, you can get all the documentation for the chips without an NDA, and you can get the um, um, all the chips through distributors, you know, in quantity one. So if you actually wanted to make this, um, you could you could do so. Um, so um, they're also entirely based off of open source software. Um, there, if you want to use the 3D graphics controller, that does require a closed source binary blob, um, which we don't even ship with right now. Um, it's possible to go and get the, the binary blob to run the 3D graphics, um, but we're just not really focused on that. We're more focused on what you can do with the open tools. Um, um, it ships with Debian on the, the, the onboard 4 gigabyte flash and um, a USB cable. And that's all you need to get started doing development. You just plug in the USB cable, plug it into your computer, um, point your web browser to it, and you're ready to go. Um, there are some, some drivers for um, Windows and Mac. Um, the drivers are actually shipped on the board. It looks like a, a flash drive. You go open the readme file, and, and it gives you the instructions for installing those drivers. You don't need to go, need to go download anything. Um, and then a ton of people built projects and products around them. Um, we don't really recommend, um, there's, uh, the, 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 the buying the boards and putting them into products, just realize you're responsible for that. Don't, don't hold us responsible for whether or not it works or not in your in the product. Um, or whether or not you can get boards in a timely fashion, right? If you want me to make sure you can go get them, um, go to a contract assembly house and have them made for you and all your supply chain. So. Um, so any, any questions on what a Beagle Bump Black is? Um, they're a lot of fun. You make a lot of cool stuff out of them. So these PRUs are these um, programmable real-time units. They're, there's two PRUs as part of the industrial control subsystem. So it's uh, designed for being able to build up peripherals or interfaces to different types of uh, devices. And um, in that industrial control subsystem, there's two of these 32-bit RISC processors that each run at 200 megahertz. Um, they only have single cycle access to um, different pins. Um, and you can get to all the other peripherals um, on the device, the, the standard GPIOs, the pulse width modulators, the quadrature encoders, the, all the other fun um, hardware, the SPI, all that. Um, but, but there's some number of pins that have this really quick single cycle access. You can actually do like a set pin high, set pin low, and produce a 100 megahertz square wave uh, coming out just by bit banging um, in, the, in, the, in the software. In fact, somebody did for a Google Summer Code project, they made a 100 megahertz logic analyzer that's 14 channels. Um, and they were actually able to, to capture uh, 14, 14 channels of data at 100 megahertz and stream that back up to the arm um, and actually do compression on that as they were streaming it back up. So they were able to capture over a gigabyte of samples at, at, um, you know, at 200 megabytes per second. So um, really quick I.O. Um, you know, kind of optimized for, for, for packet switching type of operations and emulating uh, different peripherals, doing soft peripherals. So if you wanted to yeah, bit bang things instead of dropping in an FPGA, it's kind of been a bit of a um, FPGA replacement. Um, so why and when do you choose to use the PRUs? Um, one is you don't the, the, the Linux operating system is just in your way, and you want to be able to bit bang at your leisure on these I/O signals without having either um, you know to have to go through different layers of the kernel. Um, understanding the, the, the details of that code, um, or you don't want the, the latency, or you don't want uh, the unpredictability of the, the timing. Um, and really the timing is the, the main reason. Um, it's real time because it, it, it cannot be interrupted from its given task, right? It will always, the next thing it does is execute the next instruction. Um, even in the case of getting external signals and interrupts. There's actually no interrupt vector. With, how many of you are familiar with interrupts? 
mostly. Okay. Um, so, like norm, uh, most processors, when you get an interrupt, they, they jump to a, another location and begin executing code from that location. Um, this processor doesn't. Instead, it just registers it in a, the interrupt controller, and you just, in your loop, you just go back and you, you pull the, the status. So there's a register that you can go and, and look um, at the, the status of the interrupts, and you, can, and you can clear them, but it's not really, like it, it doesn't go and change the, the flow and interrupt the process of what's going on. Right? So all of your code is in this, just this event loop where it just loops around and goes back and checks for new things to handle all over and over and over again. Um, always done that way. And, um, and yeah, so that's, that makes it, um, that makes it for very, makes it providing very, very predictable timing. Um, and also has um, really low latency from input to output. Uh, there's no pipeline, uh, even something like a, you know, Cortex M3 has like a three stage pipeline. Um, the, uh, the Cortex A8, that's the main processor that's running Linux, actually has a 13 stage pipeline. So, and, and pipelines help the processors go really fast. Um, so if you're running a marathon, I mean, if you're doing a you know, straight ahead sprint, it's perfect for that. But if you're trying to, you know, juke and be responsive to things, it's not always the greatest because by the, you know, if you want to sample an input, it's going to take 13 cycles to go through that A8. If it's not doing anything else, to go back and, and provide a, a response back to, to the output. Uh, I'm sure it's actually writing tau to it pipes line stage or they're probably closer to each other. But there's several cycles away whereas there's no cycles in between the, the operations um, on the, uh, the peer use, right? It's, there's, there's no pipeline. Um, and, um, and one thing you can't do is if, if you do need some sort of microcontroller in your system doing these sort of interfaces, um, and one of the big reasons to use the peer use, not just because they're, they're fast and they handle these low latency things, it's also built in. You can access all the internal peripherals of the um, of the device, including the external memory, right? So that that um, that logic analyzer I was telling you about, right? The reason it can work um, is because it's got access to that 512 megabytes of, of DDR that's shared with the A8. Um, so you can easily stream data to use through shared memory buffers. Um, and it's also reasons why things like um, uh, Leadscape, which um, um, Leadscape is this uh, it's a set of peer review firmware um, and uh, some other software to go around it that, that um, um, uses the peer reviews to dump data out to big LED arrays. Um, and um, so the peer reviews themselves handle all the shifting out of all those LEDs and it's a, a whole lot of uh, fast data movement. Um, but it works by just grabbing a memory buffer inside the A8 of what it actually wants to draw on the LEDs. Um, so it makes it really, really easy to create software that, like, I just write a Python script that dumps into a memory buffer what I want to draw on the sign, and it, uh, in the peer, you just grab it directly from that memory buffer and start putting it out. So um, that shared memory is a, a big deal. Um, so the types of things people are doing with them. Um, Driving motors in a mobile robot, like if you wanted to do something that was like self-balancing, um, uh, you, you can do self-balancing without the peer use. There's um, the guys at University of California, San Diego, which did theirs as a Linux task, reading the IMU um, or inertial measurement units, got the gyros and accelerometers to tell you if it's leaning one way or the other, and then setting the uh, I.O. pins in order to, to drive the, 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 the motors. Um, but you know, having that, that low latency, predictable timing and stuff makes that a whole lot easier. Um, so if you're doing that sort of thing, you see people switching over to using the, the, the peer use. Um, for those sort of things, you'll see really taking off in terms of CNC machines and 3D printers. Um, so I want a very precise timing of when I send the pulses to the stepper motors um, relative to each other so that I get smooth motion uh, of these motors um, and be able to, to move them as you know, quickly, right, so that I can get, you know, um, get my 3D prints faster um, than, um, than the peer use of the way to go. And there's this distro called Machine Kit, which is a Debian base that includes the application uh, Linux CMC. And um, 
and they use that to um, um, to, to drive all the, the G code um, for, for for doing the, the CNC and 3D printing. Um, and it also includes the the purity firmware, and there are, and for several different uh, uh, capes or add on boards for the normal black and white stepper motor drivers. Any 3D software on there, or you have to um, do it somewhere else? Um, you can just, you, there, it actually has a GUI and you can actually do previews in, in 3D um, in the Linux CNC software. You can't build it. Uh, build it? What do you mean build it? Well, build the design, 3D design. Uh, I wouldn't author it in the people on that. It seems unreasonably restrictive. I mean, you, 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 you could, um, but it would be slow and painful when you've got a fast machine somewhere else. I mean, the idea is that you want to do this, these are usually you want to dedicate it to some sort of specific function, like like running your, your, your machine, you don't need to go and spend a, you know, multiple thousands of dollars on a, on a desktop that you can't get to all the IOs that you need to do to, to create that sort of system anyway. So you could, you could try to make it a system to kind of be a replacement for your computer. Um, but I, that's not really a problem I try to solve with people once. It's not a replacement for the computer, it's something that gives you an embedded system or gets you something that um, kind of re replaces the computer in a particular system. Agree, disagree, anything? Oh, no, it was not an argument. It was right. just you know, what, uh, what people put on there. Because you brought a point that you know, people might want to view it. Um, yeah, and a preview, and a preview makes a lot of sense. Yeah, there, and there can be. I'm, I'm sure if, if you wanted to make some quick edits on there, I don't know what the Linux CNC capabilities are for everything. Where do I send flash ones to? Just swap you out. I don't have a computer, so go ahead. Um, just, just don't confuse your flash with your not flashed. Just make sure to remember if it's flashed, not to confuse it. All right. Um, so protocols, different protocol generation, um, that like real-time communication protocols. Um, all these are not programmed, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, and that's uh, that's something you do. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. The um, Mindstorms EV3 is based on a TI AM1808, which is an ARM9 processor, which is a bit older CPU, but they do include this, this PRU subsystem in that AM1808. Um, and they use it because there weren't enough UARTs on the, um, the, on the base chip, the AM1808. So they've actually using the PRUs to do software UART implementation on the, on the Mindstorms. Is that available somewhere to download? It, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, all the, the, the source for the, um, the EV3 is available. I think they have PDF schematics. I don't think they give you any layout files or anything like that, but then they do give you um, the Linux kernel source and the firmware source. So, um, in fact, um, somebody created a, last, this last week I saw on the BeagleBoard mailing list, somebody created a, a, an add on board um, they get you all the IOs for the EV3, and they and they move all the firmware over as well, um, so that you could actually do um, like the whole Lego interface on the the Beacon One Black. Is, it, is that posted anywhere? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is it part of your library? Something? It's on the Beagle Board mailing list, um, so you can find the links to it there. I don't know that he's given all of the right information for reproducing. Like, I haven't found any schematics or layout for his add on board. Um, so, what board is it? Uh, some Fat Cat Labs. It's like an EV3 field for. Oh, okay. It's so like interface with the Mindstorm? Yeah, it interfaces with the Mindstorm. And that's cool. I mean, that. Market. Um, tons and tons of projects. Um, 
people using it. Uh, the the, um, the peer use. Ah, I forgot to. I think the fourth interpreter is copied on. I need to try that out. I haven't even tried the fourth interpreter. Um, somebody did a GCC port for the peer use. Um, they started with the, the port for uh, the NEOS processor, like a synthesizable processes, processors in the Altera FPGAs. Um, uh, they started with that and they did a GCC. Made it work for the peer U instructions. There's a GCC for peer U. So you could write C code against the peer U? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So there's there's a TI, there's an official TI compiler. And mm -hmm. It's a C, C, mm -hmm. uh, compiler. And that's actually what I've got on the, 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 the boards when mm -hmm. I flashed on these boards. Um, and that's what the, we've got the some different things built with. But there's also GCC, which hopefully will get the GCC shipping with the boards here kind of soon uh, for, the, for the peer use. And I think that gives us a lot more ability to kind of integrate more tools. Uh, but the tools are still very much in a um, early phases right now for, for the peer use, right? I mean, it's great for like deep, deeply embedded systems guys and, you know, that, that kind of understand all the complexities of this stuff, you know, great. Uh, but for kind of the, the mere mortals, it's just starting to get there where it's um, where they're really programmable. And I'll, I'll show you what tools we've got with it. Many of this uh, peer you speak, um, that's kind of the example. Um, it's not in the condition I want it to be in right now, um, but I'm trying to, to fix that. I, I mean, we worked with a, a student over the summer to create the initial um, for this peer you speak. Um, and then um, working with some more students now over the, in, in this, this count, you know, this school year, uh, to try to improve the, the, the quality of that code, make it a kind of a reference of all the different components that you need in order to, to work with the peer use. Now, so it's just out of the box, you can start sending in commands, um, but then you can start peeling back the layers of, of peer use speak if you want to replace the firmware load, if you want to replace um, the device tree entries for the configuring the IO pins, you want to replace some of the, the interfaces at the kernel module. Um, and the communications between the, the, the Linux kernel and the peer you. Um, all of those are given as examples. You can kind of peel back the layers of the onion. Um, so when you said GCC and fourth, uh, you're not talking about those. Are you talking about those going direct to the peer you? Or yeah, yeah, yeah. They're GCC for the peer you. That doesn't save you from the need of, um, and I'll, I'll repeat this. I'm going to go through this in some detail. But there's kind of four things you kind of need in order to, to use the PRU, right? You need the firmware, which the GCC will help you make the firmware. Um, you need um, the, the, the kernel driver to do the, to like do the firmware loading. So you need to, to load the firmware onto the, um, onto the, to the peer use. So you need to create the firmware, you need the, the kernel driver to load the firmware and then to also to talk to it. Um, you need the device tree entries, which configure the kernel. Um, and and that, that also helps you configure the IO pins. All right, so there's that, that's just kind of a, 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 of a configuration file. Um, and then you need kind of the, the communication mechanism back and forth between the two. Um, so whatever, whatever kind of protocols you, you create, uh, for communicating back and forth, um, you need to kind of have those implemented in the firmware side and in the, um, um, and in the, the, the kernel and user space, right? So those are kind of the different levels of things. And for peer use, speak, we'll have an example that gets you all the way down to communicating and sending commands and doing stuff on the, on the, the peer use, um, and then you can just, over time, just make changes to each one, right? Um, so this is, this I chart is the, the basic architecture, um, limited to, uh, to to 8K in program memory, and each each of them has 8K, and and you're limited to that. That's all the code it can run. If you want to be able to run bigger programs, you know, you'll need to copy more program stuff in. So you can potentially page more code in, um, but generally the stuff you're trying to do is type real time anyway, and you don't need to mess with that a whole bunch. Um, they also have a separate uh, 8K data RAM um, for themselves um, that they can, they can work with, and 12K shared data RAM between the two. 
Um, so they can use that to communicate back and forth between them or just kind of allocate chunks of it for, for, for whichever one they're wanting to use. Um, and then, but they can still access external memory, so they can get to the 512 megabytes of DDR. Um, but that's generally, generally for like bulk data. What about screen memory? Screen memory, you know, they could probe any of the DDR memory. Um, but you're going to need to kind of do that physical mapping um, in order to find out. But potentially, yeah, you could talk to the frame buffer. You could. There's not a graphic card. Um, you have a. There's not a. No, it's all in one. What's called a system on chip. And um, in the system on chip, there's what's there, there's a the way that the LCDs or the HDMI and all that stuff are talked to is through this thing called a. Um, an LCD, C, uh, LCD controller, or LCDC, and all it does is it grabs this buffer out of the, the memory and it shifts it out over the pins in a certain pattern. And, and that's really, for this chip, um, as far as like the display controller, that's all it does. Some chips have more sophisticated display controllers. This one's pretty darn basic. How big is the buffer? It's entirely programmable. You can make it as big as you want. Um, the clock rate on the LCDC controller is enough where you can do 1920 by 1080 at 24 frames per second. Um, and that's just, that's that's what, it, it's data rate and moving data out from the DDR3 and into the pins is kind of limited to that. Is that what it is? Your, your, your math and your arithmetic is way better than mine. 1920. So two two, two by one. Two by one is two million times twenty-four is twenty-five. So okay, but but times multiple bytes, right? So you can do that with um, three bytes, right? So twenty-four. So times times three is one hundred and fifty megabytes per second. If that's right. Um, yeah. So that that guy will will. will dump stuff out to the, to the LCD pins, you could potentially access that same memory because it's just DDR3 memory from the PRUs. So if you wanted to, you could have the PRUs do color space conversion for you, for instance, in your frame buffers. And that would probably help speed up some of your, your like video playback. Um, similarly, the 3D graphics engine right, has just direct access to those to the DDR. Right? So like if you're doing rendering 3D objects, all it's doing is rendering them into the memory buffer. Um, if you look at the original Beagleboard, it has a more sophisticated uh, display controller that actually has multiple planes where it's doing overlays and doing color space conversion in the display controller, um, but not this guy. This guy is meant for, for, for pretty simple display systems, right? It's targeted mostly at like point of sale, point of service applications or navigation applications or industrial controllers, not so much Video games, yeah. <laughs> it's not a video game device, although it runs MAME fantastically, right? If you're just doing, but they're pretty low. But they're pretty requirements. Low requirements for speed, exactly. Um, there's also a bunch of other peripherals in here for doing things like uh, parallel and serial capture. So it's like there's, um, um, like you can you can write out to things, and there's there's shift registers that you can write out to. So you don't have to manually shift out each bit if you're trying to do a serial protocol implementation. Um, you can use the shift registers and, and, and clocks tied to shift the data out. Um, so if what you're trying to implement is a UART or like an SPI like bus, you don't have to do raw bit banging. Um, although kind of the first pass approximation for most people is that even if they're doing serial protocols is to write a, a bit bang. Um, which is how I wrote the, uh, the LCD controller, right? I just did pure Pure bit bang, set pin high, set pin low stuff. Um, the low latency pins are these 25. Uh, Which color? The ones with pure use. It's the light color, it's not so visible up here on the screen. Um, but these, are, so the, the different pure use, um, I think R30 is input and R31 is output. So, like, the there's the register bank. Um, in the, the CPU, it has 32 32-bit registers, zero through R0 through R31, and 
those last two registers, um, um, you know, it's kind of sort of classic load store architecture, risk architecture, if you know much about CPUs. Um, but, but those registers themselves are directly tied to I.O. pens. Um, so each of the, each of the pens on the, the BeagleBone uh, CAPE expansion headers um, have all the digital I.O. pens have eight different modes that can be multiplexed. Um, like some of them will be UARTs or quadrature encoders or I squared C's or the LCD um, pens and, and all sorts of different ones. Which, which side will be uh, pen, you know, do they start out with one's P9 and one's P8? So uh, the left, if the, the, Ethernet, if the Ethernet jack is on the top, P9 is on the left and P8 is on the right. Okay, so that's P9 and P8. Yeah, and it's written very small on the silk screen. And I try to refer to them always because that's the only thing that you'll find in the silk screen on the board is P8 and P9. So that's why I chose it. Um, the next for a flash board. Mm -hmm. flash, right? Right. Yeah. Okay. Just don't just remember which ones are flashed, please. Um, and of course I haven't tested the image, which will make for a really interesting day. Okay. Um, so these, um, uh, so these, so you see PRU zero and PRU one. Um, so depending on which PRU it is, um, and one thing I remember I did not do on the image was turn off the HDMI. So I'll probably want to go and edit the files. And one of the first things I'll do, I'll show you how to how to edit the um, uh, the boot script to actually disable the HDMI because um, the HDMI takes. Um, the, the, a bunch of these pins, because that's where the LCD signals come across. Um, so um, it's kind of a virtual cape, because the original BeagleBone didn't have a built-in HDMI. You could add it on as an add-on board. And all we did was just take the logic from an add-on board and put it down on the main board. Um, so you can disable it, and then you get all those pins back. If you leave it enabled, those pins are busy driving LCD. Um, but so these pins are ones you can just directly peek and poke at the registers. And um, and if you want to boot up some of these pre-flashed boards, that'd be good. The um, previous slide you has the UART zero. Is is that a a, a certain pen? Or UART zero here on the previous slide, right there at the. Bottom right corner, second one up on the right corner. You have UR zero. Uh, that's that um, yeah. This UR there's actually a UR built into the the, the ICSS. So is that one of the physical pins? Uh, yeah. It, it's um, it, yeah. It, it it can be mapped out to some of the pins. Um. So it it's um, so it's part of the industrial controller subsystem. I'd have to look at the different MUX modes, uh, to see where that comes out, but. But yeah, essentially there's a UART as part of there that you can actually use the UART to talk to the peer use. Is there code that could get me started on that? Uh, there's this, uh, any day now, there's like a whole bunch of code coming from, from TI's examples. Um, I mean, actually look, it might even be live now. Um, The reason I asked is I have a project I'm working on that uses nine data bits. I've been having a hard time finding hardware that interface with the proprietary serial protocol. Sounds pretty practical. There's not a particularly preferred place. Uh, special computing um, is pretty good about keeping stock, um, which is why you'll find them first in the pull-down list. Um, I happen to really like Adafruit. Um, you know, I believe in supporting DigiKey because DigiKey pays Robert Nelson, which is awesome. Um, Element 14 makes a, a clone 
Um, and if you buy the clone, it's the only way that the Beetleborg.org foundation is, other than uh, Google Summer of Code, um, buying boards from Element 14 is the only way the foundation is getting any money. Um, so there's a, they pay a, a small royalty for using the logo um, to make their clone. And um, so that supports the foundation, so that's good. Um, their boards are made in China, where the other boards are made in Texas. Um, so, use your your own value judgments there. Um, Logic Supply has some good like capes to go with them too, and some nice cases. They, they have some really nice cases. Yeah, like especially their cases are really great. And, yeah. and they have some nice new boards, and I have some capes on sale right now. They just got an XP cape. Pretty cool. And I, I, I like um, SparkFun, but both um, Logic Supply and Adafruit are doing more to kind of build tutorials up. Um, so yeah, thanks for the Logic Supply plug. Yeah, yeah. Um, they got a great tutorial page too. Is there any place in town that actually sells them? Micro Center, besides yeah. Micro, Micro Center, Center Radio Shack. Oh, Radio yeah. Shack, Radio Shack. Yeah, Micro Center and Radio Shack. Because Radio Shack, the last I saw them, yeah. Yeah, they only have the kits. Oh, okay. They only have the make kits. So, um, and and yeah, Maker Shed is a good one to support too, and, and Make Magazine in general because um, they've been doing all these weekend projects. Um, so they just released several weekend projects based on the Home Block. Um, gosh, there's too many people to plug. Yeah, there's tons of people selling it. But well, once we boot them up, for any specific place, I put it in Cloud Nine IDE. Yeah. yeah. And do a you named SR to make sure I got the, 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 the kernel yeah. salt. How do you get to the Uh, Just um, you can click here. And then uh, click there. <laughs> uh, actually, just change it to 43000. That's that bug I was telling you about with the uh, the Jekyll thing. Just colon 2, colon 3000. Or just period 2, colon 3000. Um, okay. So you're looking for some code to, I recommend downloading this, which is the, uh, the, the PRU software package. Um, that should include some code that talks to you how to use it in the different peripherals. I haven't looked at this actually. Um, gosh, it's been built since June. Um, I should really play around with this. Um, that that was the uh, there's a there's a TI um, set of examples the peer new software package. Um, I know it includes things like building a software UART. Um, I'm not sure if it includes something using the the, the UART that's part of the peripheral. I would imagine that they do, but I haven't seen that. Also, a link here on the the wiki um, is this list of peer new projects, which all these include examples of programming the peer new right. What's that website? Uh, Processors.wiki.ti.com. I'm just do a peer U dash ICSS. That's the peer U industrial control subsystem. And I will, I will definitely take a look at that library. There's also the starter, if we're using the peripherals outside of the ICSS, like the general peripherals, there's this uh, library called Starterware, um, which has code for doing the USB, the, the I2Cs, the SPIs, the MMC, like all those different peripherals without an operating system. And you know, we've, we've compiled that for the, the peer use and used it a couple of the different libraries without really any headaches. Um, other than you need to make sure that you disable the Linux kernel access to those peripherals, like like take them out of the device tree or somehow otherwise prevent the Linux kernel from coming in and trying to use those because that would be bad juju. Like I said, you can get to the other peripherals. Um, 
this L3 bus is the terminology for the internal bus layer where you can get to, to all those different peripherals. So if it's a peripheral on the L3, you can get to it. Um, be careful. Um, so the tools are really starting to mature this year. Um, you know, I, I'd say we're, um, you know, by early next year, this, this is going to be like really, really easy to program. Um, you know, like with uh, just as easy as other microcontrollers. There's, I know there's a port of the Arduino IDE um, to to do Arduino style programming with library for the um, for the peer use. Is that like matured a little bit? Recently? It's still ugly to me. Oh, it's good. I know. It's still pretty ugly though. Yeah. Um, it still looks like a student project. And it's still pretty incomplete. Um, so. What's it? Yeah, so trying to bring it over the finish line. Um, uh, as, uh, this is the one I'm trying to push on, and I'm, I'm not too super happy with the, the, the thing yet, this peer you speak, but um, as a general, I, I like the idea of just being able to type in commands immediately just to a file, and, and, and I'll, I'll show you how that works. Um, there's a TIC compiler, GCC4, um, this peer you speak in the, the Starterware library, and I didn't realize, and there's the, the Arduino stuff um, from the, the folks at Dutch on Brown, and then there's the, that, that, there's the, the TI examples now as well. Um, so the, again, there's kind of the, um, the four components for talking, um, uh, talking to it. Um, you know, you need some sort of uh, the Linux kernel driver. Uh, there's two main drivers out there. Um, one's been in the main line for a while, which is this UIO Pure USS. Uh, that's um, all that does is open up the registers to the PRU um, for to the the the, the your application running the, the the Linux kernel, right? So it just says, okay, I'm just going to memory map all the registers. And then you need a, still a separate library that understands how to write to those registers in order to trigger loading a different firmware. Um, we've been shipping for a while um, with the, a, a library that has a set of functions um, that you can use to load your, your, um, your firmware and to, 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 to interact with it that way. Um, but, um, it's kind of not the, the, not the preferred way to interact with it because it doesn't use the standard um, Linux kernel firmware loader, uh, and you know, it's, so the, the, it's not really properly abstracted from the Linux kernel as a as a processor. Um, so new new development is going on um, for this um, remote proc interface, and right. the difference between that is is the, the Linux kernel actually knows how to load the firmware using so remote proc. Um, so instead of it being done in user space. Kernel itself loads the firmware. Um, then you need some way to actually communicate with it, either you know some sort of user space application um, or, or you know a kernel driver for the application. You need the device tree entries to configure the pins in the driver, and then you need the actual firmware. Right. So those are the big, those are the main components. Um, and the the example we'll work with. Is um, this, this thing called Pure U Speak, right? So it's a completed firmware, ready to run. Um, was done as part of the, the Google Summer of Code, um, and it's it's still not quite ready for prime time. Um, but I've pushed it into the 3.8 kernel um, that we've we've got for for download um, uh, for the boards. Huh? It's no, it's it's not actually not shipped as an image yet. It's just a a Debian package. Um, of the, the kernel. So what you do is, and that's what I'm flashing on here, is you actually download the, um, the Debian package, um, install the Debian package um, on like one of the, the, like the 9.3 image or one of those, and then you can, and then you'll have it. So another flash board. These are all unflashed, right? Yep. Uh, that's not bad. Um, So actually, I'm, I'm probably want to plug in a flash board here fairly soon. Um, this is just flashing now. Um, is that one flashed? 
think both of these are not flashed. Both of those okay. are not flashed. Um, so, next major release that we'll have, we'll, we'll include that. Uh, it's an implementation of the thing called BotSpeak. Um, so, so, so BotSpeak is an interpreter that's implemented on Arduino, on Raspberry Pi, on the Beagle and Black and the JavaScript interfaces. And, and it all just um, is a way to just kind of normalize um, the, the interface to, the, um, uh, to any CPU. Right, so it's got the, the basic operations or things like, um, you know, set digital I.O. pin high, set digital I.O. pin low. Um, but it's all just kind of like in this assembly-like language. Um, okay, I guess they're flashing now. Um, but the nice thing about it is you can, you can, because it's a normalized language that targets all these different other platforms, um, you can have integrations to other higher level um, things like LabVIEW. All right, so the, the, the guys at Tufts you know, have a way, if you, if you, if you, if you program with LabVIEW, um, you run these VIs and it'll generate the BotSpeak code and you can connect those up and just send the code down um, to the boards. Um, uh, unlike uh, Fermata, how many of you, you guys know what Fermata is? So Fermata is a standard firmware load that's used on a lot of Arduinos and it's pretty common um, for like things, if you want to interface with higher level languages like say JavaScript, um, like a lot of, uh, a lot of the people building uh, JavaScript based robots will take a, an Arduino um, or even a BeagleBone and um, implement Fermata um, so that it, it abstracts the IOs. Um, but it's kind of a configuration based interface, right? So you can you could say blink this pin you know at this rate or you know set this pin high, set this pin low as individual commands, but you're not moving logic down to the board itself. Right, so it's 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 kind of got its set operations. It's more just a, a configuration that you can change, not a um, you know yeah not something that can actually make decisions. Um, so if you're trying to do like a, a PID controller, um, which is what you need to do for like a, a balancing bot or re, you know read from you know some sort of accelerometer or gyroscope, Fermata wouldn't really work like that very well. Um, so, so BotSpeak uh, does. It looks like assembly language. I don't know if you, how many, how many programmed in assembly? A few people? Okay. Or a little bit. <laughs> so we're going to program in something that looks like assembly today. Um, and, um, and then, uh, you know, and the way that you talk to BotSpeak is you can either talk to it over serial or network um, or just a web-like interface and it includes you know, Arduino-like operations because it's kind of built on top of the Arduino API. Shall we play? Um, so I need one of the, I'm going to borrow back one of the flashed boards so that I can show. Is this one flashed? I think that one's yeah, flashed. That should be fine. So that way I can have the same warts as opposed to using my board that I know works. Um, and I know I can do the demo on. I'd rather run into the same Headaches that um, I'm about to send you into. Um, so you give it a minute here to boot. Um, this uh, when when you plug in a, a BeagleBone Black um, that uses the Linux kernel to to implement a, a few what are called gadget interfaces, um, and those are. Um, you know, those are those are client devices. So it looks like a flash drive. It looks like a serial device that you can do some, like communications to the, uh, the the command prompt. And it also looks like a network device. Um, and it automatically starts up this um, this web server on port three thousand, um, which is the IDE. Um, it's not cloud nine, right? It is cloud nine on three thousand. There's a there's a node server there's a node server on port eighty that's not yeah right and you're just using it because it's got the terminal I'm mostly using it because it's got the terminal I will do oh shoot it, it, cloud nine doesn't support the doesn't support the home speak yet does it um well I mean it's just Python like so oh, okay. so like the, the the way to talk to to um um to peer you speak. Um, is 
Uh, you can do it a few different ways. Um, you, can, you can start this uh, TCP server, um, which will have it listen to a socket. Um, in the future, it will just be a file that you can read and write to, so provided directly by the kernel. But right now, the implementation is, is there's a Python layer that's doing the tokenization, um, and then sending um, bytecode on down to the PRUs for execution. Um, so there's just this uh, PRU speak library, which hopefully is installed. <laughs> and um, is that is it on the Python? Like, is it in pip or like? Uh, it's not. It's not in pip right now. Um, I, yeah, I just made the setup script today to actually install it into distro releases. Okay. Um, but eventually it will in, it will be in pip um, when we ship it with it. Um, actually, nobody. But it's on this Let me make sure. Uh, I've got the right kernel. That's good. <laughs> so if we use this build, if we use this build, you've got it. You got it. Um, so one is this, this this kernel right here that has it. Um, the, I got that off of um, builds.beagleboard.org. Um, you look at the grid of the different builds. So here's like the latest 3.8 build. But you see, I did this um, Bone 67 pure U speak build. And that's got the, uh, uh, the Python center, this code. Um, that's got the that's got the um, the device tree overlay and the um, the um, kernel driver. Okay. So that's those two components. And what about um, all this code that we have here in the PRU speak? Um, that is from the the PRU speak repo. So if you look under source, your space lib, that's all coming from here. Actually, I shouldn't say that it's coming from my 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 fork of it. So I got that that kernel from there. I got the the Python stuff from there. Um, the firmware is also from here. So I built the firmware. The pure U firmware is coming from here. It's all from the. So if you look at um, there's two firmware files, pure U zero and pure U one. Those are built from these um, C libraries. C C those C programs here. So what I can do, I'm going to run this um, uh, this one that's the TCP server. Before I can actually run it, I actually have to load the kernel module. So I do mod probe. You can't see last time down there. Um, so you don't That's how I load the um, <coughs> purity speak. Um, yeah, and that's the issue I was talking about before about the um, um, the IO pins being used by the HDMI. So there's two things I need to do. One is the, um, the, the mod probe of PRU speak. That loads the, uh, the, the kernel module, the kernel, um, kernel driver. Uh, but I still need to do the configuration, right, of all the, the I.O. pins. Um, so I need to load the device tree overlay, and that also sets up, uh, that sets up all the configuration parameters and, and sets up the uh, 
the firmware that's actually going to be loaded, it actually specifies the names of the files uh, for the firmware that's going to be loaded. Um, and that's this config pin overlay. Um, if, you've, if you've seen BeagleBone and Cake stuff before, you know, all that, all that config pin is doing is writing into the slots file. But if I do config, config pin overlay, and this is the name of my device tree, is bb -peer -peak. Um But it's complaining. Um, so what I have to do is make sure it's not mounted. Um, the same Error. Anything at the same time? Or? Okay, so I'm going to put it in. I'm going to unmount it from, the, uh, from my Mac. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm having trouble with the config pin overlay also. Yeah, it's 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 a um, it's um, it's because of the um, the HDMI pins. So okay. I, I configure some of those pins to, to 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 be used. Okay. So you need to disable that one first. And how do I do that? That's so I mount the the, the partition and the the, the the fat. I could have done it from my Mac, but I. I Unmounted it from my Mac and then mounted it to my uh, from my Linux machine. Now slash slash MC. Uh, it's probably still mounted under the Windows. Actually, you know what? Um, Forget there's. Yeah, we now have a copy of it running. We we have a second one running on the EXT file system, so it's much safer just to edit that one. So forget the all mount yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We now have two two UAV text, One that's on the EXT file system. Um, and that's the one that's safe to edit from the Beagle and Black itself. Mm -hmm. But you'll ordering. see, um, you'll see this line that says "Disable HDMI." <laughs> so file it. It's it's slash boot slash uenv dot text. So what type of tool do I use here? I, I use the let's use Nano. Yeah, use, use Nano. <laughs> so Nano um, slash boot slash what? It's lowercase u, capital E, lowercase nv, dot txt. So I should meant to do this before I copy all the boards. E and v, that's it, yeah. Sure. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, it's nice to, it's good to know that the HDMI is on the fly. Just, 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 I wasn't even going, what, like, what, what, what's the, going wrong, I already plugged in my HDMI cable and gone, why isn't my display working? And so, <laughs> so, oh, we've got another board that's flashed. Everybody else ready to, that's ready to program? I just need to expand your view for one. Um, where's your button? Okay, just, just grab the bar. This bar, this one? The bar. This, this bar? Yeah. Yeah, grab it. Grab it. Right yeah, left click. Uh, here. Yeah. Yeah. You guys yeah. got it? Isn't that right click? No? I got some of it. Oh, it's left click. It's right click. Right click. Left click. Did you, did you right. do the mod for her? Left click. No. I don't think she has the console up, right? Um, no. UNV dot text. How do you get the console up? Oh. Do you just bring it up? From, from Cloud9? There's it's just down at the bottom. They're both the cloud nine. We'll say. Yeah, I don't know. Union yeah, text is that. Is, the, is uh, that that's got the the file for all of the pins, right? Or uh, no, it's just the, it's just the boot configuration file. It doesn't oh. whip like um, virtual capes to load or real capes. If you have to load so we go down here to the so HDMI. Tells you which pin configuration to use, like how to how to. Which configuration the the thing should be, whether they're uh, yeah. PWM or exactly. SPI or whatever. Exactly. Oh. The, the, the disable HDMI. Yeah, it's micro HDMI. Comment. Just press enter. It's basically going to be integrated a cape that already existed. Right. Well, and so. Yep. Okay. So so I got the two the hash marks. Do I delete them or something? Or? Uh, just delete the the one hash mark below it, and that's the EMMC. You want the HDMI, not the EMMC. Oh, okay. You don't want to disable the EMMC <laughs> since you're trying to boot from it. All right. 
Well, okay, so just, so really so just <laughs> put HDMI line. It might not boot again. Yeah. Uh, the HDMI line? Yeah, no, just delete the line. Just delete that one comment. So there's, oh, so it's now when the, beforehand there was a little, a little hash mark here, and you want to remove that because the, the hash mark is a comment, so it actually ignores the line. If you remove the, the hash mark in front of it, Yes, it then knows like that it actually wants to use this. Like a virtual and cake. And so these are the virtual cakes, the HDMI so and the HDMI no audio. Memory, um, because technically they use so it's going to disable um, both of those. And if you have to use those pins, you can disable the internal memory and only use the SD. Um, you do Control X, um, just do this and then do file. Y. Just do the configuration. Yeah. Control X. I didn't have to do Y because I already saved it. And then hit Enter. Yeah. Right, and then we do shut down dash R now. And we'll see. I can't. I'm, I'm shut down dash R for restart. Uh, my screen is way too wide. Shut down dash R. Oh, yeah, can you see my, my uh, cloud nine will eventually say offline? It's yeah. telling me I've got usage problems. Shut down dash R. Yeah, but now. You have dash shut down dash r dash space now. Oh, right. You have to tell it now. <laughs> Not later. Uh, I can flash another one. Is dash t zero also doing the same thing? Right. What is that? Sorry. Just now I'm getting yours up to flashing? Uh, is this the second one is flashed? Yeah. Yeah, so I've got this one is done. I think everyone's you have got one. You got one, right? Yeah, I guess I can do it. Yeah, there you go. I'll flash. That's only my. Yeah. And now yeah, it's still, I don't know what class it was, but it's not. We don't think it's time. What's the question? Uh, so after we fix that file, yep. uh, then when we, after we reboot it, we, we still need to do mod probe. We still need to do mod probe? Yeah, because I, we haven't, um, there, there are ways to make it not have to do this manually, but I left this step manual so that you knew it was what was going on here. Um, there are files that we can edit. To make it do this, both of these automatically, mm -hmm. like that enable that enable cape thing, we could do the the BB dash PRU speak in order to get it to automatically load that device tree overlay, because that's what the, the the disable cape manager and enable cape manager those are all just telling it what device tree overlays to load for what configurations. Mm -hmm. There's also a file to tell Linux what kernel modules to load on boot. Um, for the moment, I don't actually remember where it is, but uh, but that could be pretty easy to find. It's just a Linux boot file. It's not a uh, firmware or anything like that. We'll file um, you talking about firmware? You're talking about firmware for the peer use, or what are you, what are you, what are you talking about? What do you mean Talk about firmware. I don't know what the usage is here. Typically, there's a firmware built into uh, the hardware, um, so and if you change that, you're turning. You know, the only thing you can change on the Beagle Ball and Black is the contents of the EMMC. Um, and unless you like actually short a wire, you can't change the contents of the EEPROM that's built in. So if you if you short one wire, you can change the EEPROM. But you can't actually change the ROM. You can't change anything that's going to break your board. Um, the, wor the, the worst thing you have to do is if you say it's bricked, is that you can have to go to boot to an external EMMC in order to reflash your onboard EMMC. So, um, you can't actually like overwrite the firmware of the device itself. It's all read-only memory. This one's not throwing out for me. Okay. I, just tested I found one of them that wasn't. Yeah. But unfortunately, I recycled it. <laughs> so I think we're going to be missing it. There's another, Is there another one, one down there. There's one here. That's a reason. It's not flash, but we got that one. There's the one more flash. Okay. For everyone to have one. All right. I'm ready to see something work. Mm, me too. All right, so um, let me go back and put the side on that. So the, um, I've already, done, I did the mod probe. Cool. I did the mod probe here, you speak, and then did the config pin um, overlay. You notice this time it didn't give me an error? Yay, my HDMI isn't in the way. And if I wanted to find out what that error was, I actually have to look at dmessage. That's the kernel log. Um, but if you type in, so if you type in D M E S G, you get that kernel log. 
you see here it's successfully configured the peer use and it's all happy in Funky Aurea. Um, so you can look at all the different success messages if you want to look at them. But, um, this, this BS, it's a power appropriate, um, the, the bot speak TCP server, if I just run that, it's a Python script. Uh, shoot, apply is installed. Oh no. Oh no. It is, it is Python, it's a lexical analyzer. It's like Yak or Bison. Yeah, so it's a module that I depend on. And um, I thought I copied it. Like converting Python to some uh, Well, that's what's letting Python read that is stuff that looks like assembly. Um, yeah. Um, is there a Python based to Yak tool? Make you a copy of that now. You have a micro in there. Awesome. Oh, yeah, there's no ply here. It's a fork. I got pure use speak, but no ply. Fast fork. Um, slightly faster. <laughs> Alright, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to do something crazy here. Um, I don't know how everybody else is gonna do this, but um, clean it off. Uh, is that not in PIP? It is in PIP, but I need to be on a network in order to. You're not online? Uh, I am. My Beagle one is in. Oh, of course. Yeah. I need an Ethernet cable. If I had an Ethernet cable, it makes it really simple. I've got a um, wireless. I got an Ethernet cable. Uh, you know, why, don't I, why don't I. Okay, let's really go to see the cover pants. Let me. Um, download it once and we can USB it around. Alright. Um, and now that. we're doing this. Uh, well, do we have a warp Ethernet here? Right here, I think. Do we have access to it? With this? There is somewhere. Oh, well then. One of the things? Oh, exactly. Then let's cheat. Just don't tell anybody that you guys put into the. <laughs> that was my thought. It's totally secure. <laughs> let's see if it gives me an IP address. If it doesn't work, work, then how are we going to get that to everybody else? Uh, we'll pass around the cable one every time. Or, or USB. Or, or we can put it on a USB drive. Cable might be even easier. I don't know if anybody, does anybody know how to, to copy a Python library? Really? Yeah. I've never done that. I've always just, just pulled pip to pull it out from here. It'll be easy to do that yeah. if we can. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, because yeah, you can easily install an egg. Yeah. Right, so. But does an egg have all the content? The egg has all the, the content, or is it just the. Uh... Yeah, I yeah. think it could be either. Uh, it looks like I have an IP address, so pip install apply. They might even be like a pip download for offline use of some sort. I don't remember the command. But... Yeah, there's like a cache, I think. Um, How much of the room is on this image anyway? Okay, it's got to be some. Apply is uh, lowercase or case? Got 140 right case. Case. That's lowercase. All right, let me try running the TCP server again. TCP server. All right, we'll do that. Now, what that allows me to do, there's, there's a great utility called Netcat. Um, the way this will work in the future, when, when I actually am done with this, is there will just be a file that you can read and write to. Um, as opposed to using a TCP IP socket. Um, you still can use a TCP IP socket if you want. But um, So right now, if I want to say run something on the peer U, I could do a set I of AA. So instead of a TCP IP socket, you can use what? A file. A file. I'll just read and write a file. So you could just do like um, screen if you wanted to in that file, or uh, um, you know, because it, it just that file would just be something that you do IO into. No, no. You have to go through network for the TCP. This would actually be faster to just do a file. Um, the network stack is file stack. Yeah, the file I/O stack is, is there's less layers going through a file I/O stack. There's no. That's only going to come into play if you were trying to get close to real time, though. I think, right? Well, the, all the real time stuff you offload anyway, right? This is yeah. just for talking exactly. to it. So yeah. I now stored a variable onto my peer U, right? Uh, this is not peer U assembly, this is bot speak stuff, which looks just like assembly, but I set the variable I 
to be AA. So I can get the variable I, and it still has the value AA. I can set the variable J to uh, BB, and I can get the variable I, and that variable I is still 170. Yay. Or AA. Awesome. Um, but let's let's do something fun and um, so you don't indicate line marks since you're done with your pit. Uh, I can ex I can pass the Ethernet on. Um, and I needed to do DH client for some reason. It, could, it probably would have eventually got back to running the the, the, the DHCP client, but I just forced it uh, by running DH client manually. So P nine. You just need to do the tip, right? It's the one on the left. We're going to have to connect the address. Type in the config and see if it happened. I, I happen to know if, if config is I have to config. I happen to know pin 42 is um, you know, P942 and, um, and P9. P942 is GPIO 4 on the PRU 0. And uh, P946 is ground. Um, so, and this LED has a resistor built into it. So, if you wire this up on your breadboards, I, I advise you to put a resistor in serial. But P942 and ground, um, and I can do set DIO 4 to 0, and my LED goes off. And I can do set DIO 4 to 1, and my LED goes on. It's magic. But um, the nice thing, so the, the whole purpose though of bot speed isn't that I just want to sit here and type individual commands into it, but I do have this ability where I can like have a high level language like Python. I think I've read uh, for it. Yeah, <laughs> and, and I have a simple, yeah, I have a simply, um, yeah, REPL, which is a command line interface for those that don't know. Um, but that's kind of cool. Um, but what you can do is you can start a script by typing in the script keyword. Um, so if I start a script, I can do something like set DIO for so let's start with high, and I'm gonna wait 100, which is 100 milliseconds. Set DIO four to zero. Wait another hundred milliseconds, then go to zero. Oh man! So you can create labels. Labels in bot speak are variables. So if I if I were to create a label, um, it would it would remember that what that number is that I can go to it. It's kind of ugly, honestly. Um, but um, so it's not really super great for coming up with functions and stuff. It'll probably make some improvements to the language in order to really make it work nicely. But go to zero, take me back to the beginning. I then do end script and the magical run. Blinky LEDs! All right. Not that. Nobody's nearly as excited as I was. Everybody's <laughs> trying to catch up. I'd be really excited if it was uh, 2812. If my light was <laughs> If your light was blinking. <laughs> I got a blue light blinking. That's almost well, I'm, yeah, I got numerous blue, blue lights. Blue light. both, anybody else need a flash board? Are we done flashing no, boards? No, we, we need to, uh, I, think, I think we're good flashing boards. Do you guys have any? Yep. Yeah. I'm, I'm doing mine. But. Um, so can we move all non-flashed boards from the table so that I... Um, so all the boards on the table are flashed? Uh, this one is in process. Oh, and this, this one. Yeah, because I just need to mark those differently when I put them back in the box. Just so that I don't waste yeah. the extra time. Um, that, that's a local USB. IP address. Well, yeah, it's going to be local, but um, that's your USB. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, while this is running, I can actually do things like uh, I don't know. Actually, I've, I've never tried this actually, but I can do get the IO four. Client. DH client. DH client. DH zero. Yeah. It's got to be faster. Yeah. You want to catch it to be one, right? We'll tell you it it seems like randomly I should be able to get back a one at some point, so maybe it's not implemented actually. The git is not implemented properly. Um, and if I want, I can start a new script. Um, but typing in all these scripts like this is, is kind of a pain. Um, 
the course not letting up, that link is not active. That's why I can so around to see if it was working or not. And it's not. So, uh, this this circle that's running right here, yeah. this but is my Python script know. that's listening to the yep. TCP IP not port. Work. Right. right right now the implementation yeah, is, working. here's a Python script that's doing the tokenizing and, and uh, assembling it down to bytecode. It's shoving the bytecode down to the peer use that's running the interpreter. So the, the, the peer use aren't actually looking at the text strings, um, they're just looking at numbers. So, so how do you do that? Do you go through shared data or something? Do yeah, there's a shared, shared memory memory? buffer, right? That's the and there's the interesting part. So now we're gonna like we're gonna kind of get a little bit familiar with this, and we're gonna start peeling back depending on how much okay. time we have the layers in the onion to see how this is implemented. Okay. Um, no, it's not. And I don't know that everybody has to get to the point of linky LED. It may not be that so interesting to everybody. Um, but for some people, just being able to do that sort of stuff is. That's kind of cool. Proof that I can then interact with the motor or do whatever. Right. Um, so other scripts here. Um, so um, with, the, with the Python stuff, I'm going to just go ahead and stop this TCP okay. server. Um, okay. Notice the thing still keeps running because it has absolutely nothing to do with the Python code that's running. It's running independently, right? So I don't have to keep talking to it or anything. It's not it, it, that CPU is just running entirely independently. Um, but here's some other scripts. Um, this one is actually testing something and wasn't implemented in the interpreter, um, which caused me some headaches when I was, I was trying to create my, um, my interface to the LCD modules. Um, I'm just gonna skip that test. Um, but here, if I, so I can, I can use the Python interface to the, the, the peer you speak. Uh, to, to run several scripts after one after another. So this first script is just going to load a um, uh, essentially a wiki LED. Um, but see here now, the delay is actually programmable. It's a variable. Um, did you want to do you install pip? No. Or install PLY. Or PL, PLY. Pip, pip install PLY. Um, I've got an, another flash here that, so at the, um, in the script it, it says go to loop, whichever loop is running. Um, so I start out with the loop being set as flash. So you can see you have variables, you can store the branch addresses to, um, and then if I change that to flash two, you can see it's gonna do a, um, a blink twice and then have a twice as long delay. Um, and so I have that, that script, that's my script, and then I can immediately execute these couple of other commands. And this is how, the, the, with, with peer you speak, this is how I can create the dynamic communication between the two, is that I can always go back and update variables, right? And it's doing that with, with shared memory. Um, it's loading the program through shared memory, um, and then I can use individual instructions, um, and, you know, as, as, or use shared memory in order to communicate. Um, so here I'm just gonna update the variable a loop um, to start down, I'm going to run the loop flash, and then if I want to do the double flash, I'll set the loop to the flash too. Yeah. Okay, so I've got um, here you see now when it runs. Running. Oh, what is it the right? Okay, so once I have the uh, server running. Some fail here. What do I do? That was interesting. It didn't work the first time. I don't know why. Okay, so I've got the server running. No. Uh, then I opened up another window and I started Netcat, um, which is NC. So in, Netcat is just a, a, a Linux utility that uh, you can use to open up a, a, a TCP IP port. And so are you familiar with the, the Linux utility CAT? C A T? Is it CAT out files or? Yeah, it's 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 it it just provides like a, a, a file I/O from a from a program. If like if you type cat in a file, it puts that out to standard out. Um, and if you um, you know write into cat, you write it takes standard in, right? So it's just a standard in or standard out or standard file I/O mechanisms for 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 Linux. Um, Netcat does the same thing but with TCP/IP ports. Yeah. 